Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our Gospel lesson for this 22nd Sunday after Trinity from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. The parable of the unforgiving servant will consider especially this 33rd verse in which the king says to his servant, Should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? This is the text. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Christ Jesus, what a joy it's been to serve for the last four years as pastoral counselor for our LWML zone. It's been nice to get to know the ladies not just at our congregation, but at all of the congregations in our circuit. One thing I've found is that I can prepare pretty much whatever Bible study I want, as intense as I want it to be, and everyone follows it just fine and seems really interested in discussing the meaty issues that we delve into. We truly have a circuit that loves the Word of God. But you know, one thing that I learned when I took the reins from Pastor Bartell is that there's a reason. It's called the Lutheran Woman's Missionary League. That truly, the LWML seeks to embody the heart of a missionary. And that's expressed at the conclusion of the LWML pledge, where the ladies say that they are to engage in the great task of bringing the lost and erring into eternal fellowship with God. That's the heart of a missionary, and it's also the heart of God Himself. It's the heart of our Heavenly Father, who truly seeks to bring all of the lost and erring into eternal fellowship with Him. Pastor Bartell urged me to try and make sure that we always emphasize specifically foreign missions as much as we can in our LWML meetings. That's what really sets us apart. That's what the goal of uh, the might gathering is, missions foreign and domestic, but with a, an emphasis on those who have not yet heard the Word of God, who still need to be reconciled to their Heavenly Father. But the thing about the missionary heart, as summed up in that LWML pledge, is that it's a heart that God expects all of us to have. We are every one of us to be concerned to bring the lost and erring into eternal fellowship with God. Now that doesn't mean that we must do this as a condition for our salvation. Our salvation does not depend upon our missionary zeal. We don't bring the lost and erring into fellowship with God so that we can uh, count up a tally and present it to Him as if He will admit us into His kingdom because of our good work bringing people along with us. No, we do it because how can we not reflect the merciful heart of God who has forgiven our sin and brought us lost and erring sinners into eternal fellowship with Himself. There's maybe no better expression of this principle than today's Gospel lesson. In the parable of the unforgiving servant, what we see is a king who of course stands in for God, who shows unimaginable mercy to a servant under his authority, who owes him a crushing debt, and he expects that servant to show that same mercy to those who owe him. And when he finds that the servant does not bear his own heart of mercy toward his fellow servants, he rejects him and says, you're going to have to pay your debt after all. This text teaches us some important things about the heart of God and how God expects us to bear that same heart toward our neighbors. And it all has to do with reconciliation, being brought into eternal fellowship with Him. First of all, God does not bear grudges, and neither should we. Second, God does not seek a false reconciliation. He seeks true reconciliation through repentance, and so should we. Third, God doesn't sit back and wait for His enemies to make the first move. 
He makes the first move toward us, and so should we. And finally, when God finds repentance, He is free with His forgiveness. He doesn't hold any of His forgiveness back. He forgives from His heart, and so should we. God doesn't hold grudges. Maybe tempting for us to hold grudges. That's something that uh, I've struggled with when someone does something really nasty to you. The easiest thing in the world is just to fold your arms, sit back, and say, well, I want nothing to do with him. Imagine if God held such grudges. If God could say, Adam, whom I created from the dust of the earth and gave my own spirit. Adam and his wife Eve, they have sinned against me, they rebelled against me, they spat in my face. I want nothing to do with them. I want nothing to do with their descendants. They can all go to perdition as far as I care. If God held grudges, we would all of us be eternally lost under His unending wrath. But praise God, He does not hold grudges. When Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and plunged all of their descendants into sin and death, God did not lean back content with their damnation, but He rather strove for their salvation. He did whatever it took to deliver them, to obtain genuine reconciliation with them. That brings me to the second point, that God doesn't desire a false reconciliation. He seeks a true reconciliation that takes place through repentance. And so should we. Now, I often hear in the news about when atrocities are committed against Christian groups, the Christians will respond by saying, we forgive the shooter, we forgive the perpetrator, we don't hold it against him. Now that's certainly laudable, but there's an important part missing here. Repentance. What good does it do to forgive when there's no repentance, when there's no actual reconciliation? And we cannot say that we have entered into fellowship with one another. It would be like if you had a neighbor who likes to shovel his snow into your driveway who likes to rake his leaves into your yard, who likes to throw trash on your property, let his dog do his business on your grass. And you say, you know what? He and I are best friends. We love each other. We get along great. He never talks to me. We don't have anything to do with each other. Yeah, he trashes my lawn all the time, but we get along just fine. I love my neighbor, and I'm sure he loves me. It would seem almost like a form of insanity, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you really want to be a good neighbor and enter into actual fellowship with this person? Maybe start living as if you really do love one another? What if God were content with such a sham reconciliation? What if God just sat up in heaven and said, Yes, my children have spat in my face. They constantly disobey me. They never speak to me. They don't want anything to do with me. But it's all good. I love them, and I'm sure somewhere in those sinful hearts of theirs, they love me. We don't have anything to do with each other. We're not going to spend eternal life together, but we get along just fine. That would not be for us to enter into eternal fellowship with God. God strives to establish fellowship in reconciliation. God strives to bring about repentance in those who are opposed to Him. And so should we. The thing is, it's much easier to seek a sham made-up reconciliation than it is to do the hard work of actually bringing about repentance and fellowship. You know, if I had a neighbor who was constantly shoveling snow into my driveway, constantly raking leaves into my yard, constantly throwing trash onto my property, constantly letting his dog do his business on my grass, what would be most easy for me would be just to ignore it. Just let it go. But what is needful is that I make the first move. 
And that brings me to the next point. God doesn't sit in heaven patiently waiting for us to make the first move. Rather, God takes it upon himself to make the first move in seeking reconciliation with us. And so should we. We see how this plays out in the history of our salvation. God did not wait for Adam and Eve to come to him. He went and sought them walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Even as they played the blame game and avoided taking responsibility for their sin, God didn't wait for them to come to their senses. He rather promised them the woman's seed who had crushed the head of the serpent. God didn't wait for Abraham to call upon him. God called him out of heathenish darkness and gave him the promise that in his offspring would all the nations of the earth be blessed. God didn't wait for the human race to beg him for mercy. God made the first move, sending his Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. God made the first move for our salvation bringing us a redemption and a salvation that we did not deserve. And God expects us to do the same. When someone has offended you, isn't it easy just to stew over it, maybe for weeks, months, years at a time, and not do anything? And you might feel reasonable, you might feel vindicated in doing that, say, he's the one who offended me, he should make the first move. He should come and try and reconcile with me. But that's not what God calls us to do. God calls us to have mercy as he has had mercy. God calls us to make the first move toward reconciliation. Going back to our fictional neighbor, it does no good just to wait for him to come to his senses. That's not going to happen. What needs to happen is you bake him some cookies and bring them over there and say, let's talk about our relationship. Now that would make me awfully uncomfortable. But in our relationships with one another, with our fellow Christians, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, that is what we are called to do. We are called to take that uncomfortable step and seek reconciliation. And not a false reconciliation, not a made-up reconciliation, but a reconciliation involving repentance, where we actually strive to dwell together in peace and unity. Consider how the king forgave his servant. He didn't sit back and say, you know what, it doesn't matter that you owe me all this money. I gladly forgive it. No, he called him to account. He sought reconciliation. And when the servant demonstrated that he could not pay, but that he was distraught to his heart over this disruption in their relationship and the fact that he was going to go into slavery together with his whole family, the king relented and had mercy and reestablished fellowship, reconciliation with his servant. It was only after repentance that this took place. So also, God makes the first move, urging us to repentance, but He does not forgive our sins until we repent, until we turn from our evil way by His Spirit and seek His mercy for the sake of Christ. And now comes the critical moment. How does God respond when we seek His mercy? How does God respond when we confess to Him our sin and say, we cannot pay this debt of sin that we owe you. We are helpless before you. Surely we deserve hell and death. Please have mercy upon us. How does God respond to that? He responds with full and free forgiveness. And He doesn't just forgive as a formality. He forgives from His heart. When you hear the words that your sins are forgiven from Jesus' sake, know that those are not just bare expressions. They actually disclose to you the genuine heart of God. That God's heart toward you is a heart of mercy, of consuming love. That God desires eternal fellowship with you. He wants you for His own. He is not content that you should go to perdition. He is not content that you should go for eternity unreconciled to Him. He wants you. And He was willing to do whatever it takes to obtain you, even forgive your entire debt of sin. And we are called to do the same. When you have done that hard work of getting over our grudges, 
seeking genuine reconciliation, making the first move and going to speak with the offending brother, then when we encounter repentance and a desire to reconcile, we are to have the heart of God toward our neighbors and forgive from the heart, holding nothing back, but embracing our neighbor in love and in full and complete reconciliation, even as our God in Christ has done for us. Now that's true, of course, on an individual level. This is how we should be living as Christians in the fellowship of Christ. But it's also true on a more corporate level that the Christian church is to seek the reconciliation of all people with God. We are, after all, the means that God has given to the world to bring them into reconciliation with Him. We who proclaim His Word and administer His sacraments, we are to bear the message of reconciliation to those who so desperately need it, to the lost and erring who will perish apart from fellowship with God. So let us all have the heart of our Lutheran Women's Missionary League, the heart of God, the heart of a missionary, the heart of a reconciler. Let us not lean back content in our grudges, nor let us be satisfied with a false, made-up reconciliation. Let us rather pursue genuine reconciliation and true, lasting fellowship of love, not waiting for others to make the first move, but ourselves taking on the task of pursuing reconciliation with those who have sinned against us. And when we do so, let us bear the heart of God toward our neighbors, richly and abundantly forgiving them for all things, even as He has forgiven us. God grant that through the knowledge of our forgiveness in Christ, we may be filled with His Spirit and thus led to reconciliation with all people, that together we may live in fellowship with one another, and especially with our God in Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.